Morning, everyone. <coughs> Morning. 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 Okay, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce Andy to us this morning. Um, the first time I met Andy was about six, seven years ago at Costa Coffee in Uxbridge, uh, where he was performing um, a stand-up comedy routine, which was, uh, and he made me laugh, so that was a good thing. Um, and then it's, it's, it's interesting that that was kind of like in the kind of guise of when I was working for Trinity. And then after the wilderness years where, you know, he <coughs> didn't like me or anything. Um, so he didn't contact me or I didn't contact him. Kind of stuff. Full circle and now through Tear Fund, um, we kind of like met up again and uh, worked together. So last night we were in Liverpool um, doing some stuff, doing, and he was doing a stand up routine, he did some stand up comedy last night and I was hosting it. Um, he now uh, also, his role as a, as, a, a past, as a preacher and an evangelist at his home church in Chesterfield. Uh, so we have the pleasure of hearing him come to preach to us this morning. So Andy, come and uh, let me pray for you. Yeah. Father, we thank you for Andy. Um, we, we pray, Father God, that as he speaks, we will hear your voice. Uh, we will be challenged this morning, be convicted, Lord, um, and we will know your presence with us, Lord, and we will leave here changed because of the things you say through. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Uh, hi. 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 I've got a word for you from the Lord. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. You're up for that. You're up for hearing what God says oh, about yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, all of you guys. Yeah. So this is for you, uh, Greenford Baptist Church. You'll recognise it, but it's still about you. It says, uh, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on you, because the Lord has anointed you to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent all of you to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. That's about you guys. What about that? Now, obviously, that is Isaiah 61, and it's originally a prophecy about the coming of Jesus. But because it's about Jesus, it's also now about you. So in Romans 4, Paul talks about Abraham. Paul says that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. And then it says, and this is amazing, it says, the words it was credited to him were written not just for him, but also for us who believe in Jesus. So everything, the Bible is not about you, don't get me wrong. This is not a self-help talk. This is about the Lord, right? But the Bible is for you. You are, when you become a Christian, you become part of this story. Let me give you an example. We had a barbecue over the summer. And um, I was cooking the meat. And when I finished, it was in a part, when I finished cooking the meat, I shouted, meat ready. Classic thing to say when you finish cooking the meat. Meat ready. And... There were people like Andy Robertson there, sitting very close to the barbecue. <laughs> so that when the meat was ready, when the steaks were ready, they could snaffle them before anybody else got there. <laughs> so my voice reached the Andy Robertsons of this world, first of all. However, I made sure that my voice carried so that the kids playing on the outskirts of the park also heard me say, the meat is ready. That is the analogy I want to make. We are not the primary audience for Isaiah 61, but God's voice, the voice of the eternal God, has carried through the centuries, through the eons, through the years, so that we sitting here in West London in 2018 can hear these words and know that the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on us. Because you know what? If the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord isn't on you, and you, then you can't go and proclaim good news to the poor. You're not going to help the captives to be free. So you better hope that it really is. But the good news is, and we call it the, that's why we call it the gospel. Gospel means good news. The good news is that you, as a church, have your ability and capacity and availability to go and proclaim freedom for the captives. And the captives around here, you don't need his brain to pray for the world, but you can't solve problems in Syria. You can't solve the problems between America and Russia. What you can do is to love your neighbours. In the, is it North Holt Green from what would you call it? Yeah. yeah. You can release people from captivity in this area. You only have to hold your part of the line. In this massive cosmic spiritual war, you're on this part of the line, so just fight. Fight this part of the line. Hold this part of the line. Preach peace. Preach freedom. We've been given a ministry of reconciliation, so let's use it. So it's good news. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on you. Amen. And I just encourage you this morning to leave knowing that that is true. And we'll talk about the difference between knowing and feeling in a little bit. 
So I live in uh, Chesterfield, but uh, I've only been there for, for two weeks. I was in Huddersfield before that. And uh, I don't know if I've got any football fans in, but I was in Huddersfield when Huddersfield won the playoff final a couple of years ago. They'd be reading on penalties. And I was there in Huddersfield. And I'm not a Huddersfield fan, um, so I wasn't watching the match. I'd gone for a cheeky Nando's. But they all came racing out of the pub. They'd had, it's the first time in 30 years they got through to, they got to the top line. They all came racing out of this pub. And this one guy, and they went absolutely crazy. And this one guy kept, comes up to me. And he says, here mate, isn't it great news? Isn't it great news? We're to, to, to premiership, isn't it great news? <laughs> now, that is a pretty good Huddersfield accent. <laughs> I should also let you know it's my generic northern accent. <laughs> this has happened in Sunderland, exactly the same place. <laughs> It's into great news. And before I had a chance to react in any way, he raced off, laughing to tell somebody else. And as this guy ran away, I thought, oh my goodness me, I've just met an evangelist. I've just met an evangelist. I have met someone who has seen something that has changed his outlook. It has filled him with joy, and he cannot wait to tell people. And do you know why? I work as an evangelist. That is now my job. This guy was a better evangelist than me. Do you know why he was a better evangelist than me? Because he wasn't bothered what I thought. <laughs> he had no fear. He, he didn't care whether I knew anything about football or liked Huddersfield Town. He had something to share. And before my cynicism could do anything, he raced off, safe in the knowledge that he had good news. And that my cynicism couldn't touch him. Unfortunately, I don't know loads of Christians that excited about Jesus as this guy was about Huddersfield Town. And you know what? We should be. Because Huddersfield Town, everything suggests they're going down this year. <laughs> <laughs> but as Christians, we're going up and we're staying up, so we should be excited, shouldn't we? In uh, Luke chapter 2, when the angels appear to the shepherds on the hillside, they say, we bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Not just people who have won the playoffs. Good news of great joy for all people. We've got to be excited about it. And you know what? You can't proclaim good news to the captives. And you can't release the people from prison. Sorry, I'm about four hours sleep. I don't really know what my words are saying. I'm just kind of hoping that my sentences will end well and not, not all of them will. We can't do anything. We can't share the gospel. We can't make disciples until we're excited about the gospel. Like this guy was excited about Huddersfield Town. If, if they'd lost, he wouldn't have told me anything. Like, there's no condemnation in what I say here. But I just encourage you, we, we've got to be excited about the gospel. And we get excited about the gospel by knowing that it's good news. By knowing who we are in the light of who God is. The good news is that God is your Father and He loves you unconditionally. And there is no other worldview, there is no other religion where God loves you unconditionally. We can call it the good news because none of the other news is that good. And we'll come on to that later, but honestly, as I've been studying world religions recently, no one else has got good news. So we, we can be excited. We can know who we are. And once we know who we are, once we know who he is, and we're excited, then we will make disciples because we will be sharing the gospel. So we call it the gospel because it's good news. Anyway, in Acts 14, uh, Paul and Barnabas in Derby and Lystra. They've been in Derby, they go along the A50 to Lystra. Um, a lot of the Book of Acts is set in the East Midlands. Don't you? And they're having a great time, they're preaching the gospel, it's going really well. The crippled guy gets healed, it's brilliant. And the crowd have seen nothing like this. And they get really excited, but they're also really confused. They say, oh, you guys must be Greek gods, we've never seen anything like this. And Paul and Barnabas say, no, 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 you've misunderstood us. We are, we are just men. We've come to tell you about Jesus, but the crowd aren't having any of it. They say, no, we're going to sacrifice some oxen. You are definitely Greek gods. Then, a group of uh, Jewish guys from another place, they come in, they turn the previously receptive crowd into a riotous mob. They absolutely beat the flip out of Paul. They throw him out of the city, leave him for dead. The apostles gather around, they pray over him, and what happens? He gets back up, and then what happens when he gets back up? He goes back in. He go Are you kidding? He goes back in to the place where he's been met with confusion, cynicism, and physical violence. He goes back in. Why? I'll tell you why. Because isn't it great news? <laughs> isn't it great news? He's got good news of great joy. And their cynicism, their violence, can't touch what he knows about himself. His identity is secure. People can hurt your body, and they can say words against you, but they can't touch your identity. 
Because before anybody else said anything, God spoke first. God spoke your identity before anybody else had a say. And that's why we call it the gospel, because it's good news. Compare Paul to me. Not many people would do that, but compare Paul to me. I am, the technical term for me is a coward, okay? So when we moved, um, we lived in Mossside in Manchester before we moved to Huddersfield, before we moved to Chesterfield. And uh, Mossside used to be a really rough area, lots of good stuff now. There's a Christian bakery now called Forget Behind Me Satan. It's a really uh, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. I didn't say it was a popular bakery, I just said it was a bakery. <laughs> when we moved to um, Mossside, um, my wife said to me, we moved to this cul-de-sac. My wife said to me, I'll unpack the box, you go down the road to Aldi and get us some basic provisions. So you come out of our cold, so 200 metres on the left, there's a big Aldi. You're familiar with Aldi? Yeah, yes. yes. So, I'm, I'm there, I'm in the Aldi, I'm getting all the basic provisions that you can get from Aldi. Uh, bread, milk, fishing rod, it's all in that middle aisle, <laughs> it's all there. I've got a donkey on sale, I'm a donkey. Come on, mate. <laughs> that wasn't the sound of a donkey, I didn't plan to do the donkey, actually. Anyway. I'm in the queue in Aldi behind the woman who turns out to be my new next door neighbour. Lovely lady, 80 years old, Anne, her name is. Now, I didn't know at the time that Anne was my new next door neighbour. Had I known she was my new next door neighbour, of course I would have made polite conversation. <laughs> Equally, had Anne known that I was her new next door neighbour, she might not have looked quite as petrified when I followed her home. <laughs> <laughs> this is the... <laughs> to the cul-de-sac and Anne saw that I was still gaining ground like Terminator 2, <laughs> it became obvious that she thought I was going to mug her. <laughs> and to be honest, part of me thought, well, you've done the legwork, she'll yield quite easily at this point. <laughs> Take the fishing rod and go and live in the woods, start a new life. I would never do that. I'm, I'm a Christian man, I want to be a man of peace. Uh, I was never going to mug her. I didn't have chance. Anne saw that I was still there and behind her and gaining ground. And so she picked up speed and raced inside, inside her house and bolted the door and I heard it lock. I thought, oh no, this is terrible. What? I've only been here for two hours. I'm supposed to be here to build community, not to totally decimate it. I can't allow this. This poor old lady. I can't allow her to be trapped in a house thinking there's some kind of weird stalker on the loose. I'd better go over and explain. <laughs> the worst idea I've ever had. So I went over and knocked on the door, as you can imagine she didn't answer, <laughs> despite me standing outside saying, I know you're in there! <laughs> I just want to talk! <laughs> Don't worry, we are going to come back to the Gospel. I'm a pro-medium preacher and a pro-medium, so you should get both in one, you're very lucky. Um, Later on that, that's not where the story is, later on that day, uh, as it turns out, you see, Anne, the only reason that Anne was in Aldi in the first place, was to buy a Victoria sponge cream cake as a welcome gift for her new neighbours, you see. Yeah. She brought Anne later on that day, later on that day, I am in my house, my wife has taken our girls out, our two little girls, to see uh, some of the other neighbours. But I'm not expecting visitors, so when the doorbell goes, I just think it's my family returning. And if you've got young kids or grandkids, you'll know that what young kids like most of all is when grown adults act like young kids. I've got this thing I do with my daughters all the time. They love it. They can't get enough of it. They won't see me. I'll just creep up on them stealthily. And then when they're not expecting it, I'll just jump out like this. It's great. They can't get enough of it. So the doorbell goes. I think it's my family returning. It's not. It's eight-year-old Anne clutching a Victorian sponge. Possibly looking over her shoulder for me stalking her. I wish this wasn't true, but I promise you it is. I went to the door, I unbolted the door, and then thinking it was my young girls, I opened the door to Anne like this. There you are! <laughs> the point is this, for the next few weeks, for the next few weeks, I couldn't, I would not go out of the house if I thought that Anne was there. I was so embarrassed. I was so pridefully embarrassed. I thought, yes, I've come here to build community, to tell people about Jesus, but I've ruined it with that. Someone else will have to get her because I've ruined it. On one occasion, I heard her rattling her car keys outside and I lay on the carpet <laughs> in case she looked through the window. I was afraid, and this is where the problem comes in. Because the Bible tells me a few things about fear. The Bible tells me, first of all, that I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. 
The Bible also tells me that there is one thing in the universe that does <coughs> definitively cast out all fear. And it's perfect love. Perfect love is not a weird concept. Perfect love is a who? It's God. It's the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus Christ. Perfect love is a who? So there's a problem here. Because I'm a Christian and I believe the Bible conceptually. So if I am a Christian and yet I am lying on the floor in fear, not believing really that I've been given a spirit of love, power and self-control, there's a problem. And the problem for me, and this is why I mentioned Isaiah 61, is that I don't understand or haven't understood that this is for me. It's about Jesus and it's for me. And it's talking to me. See, the Bible doesn't ever say, because the Bible says more than it says anything else, do not be afraid. It tells you that more than it says anything else, do not be afraid. It doesn't say, you know, don't be a badger, or don't be the Eiffel Tower, or don't be a Spurs fan. God knows there's no danger of anyone being any of those things. There's no danger of anyone being any of those things. Is that the end? Spot on. Thank you. But, like, God, God knows that our, what we tend to do, our tendency, we tend towards self-preservation. We tend towards survival. He knows that. So that's why he says, do not be afraid. And the Father's voice is not the voice of a strict teacher. He doesn't say, do not be afraid, you idiots. He says, my child, you don't need to be afraid. That's the Father's voice. You don't need to be afraid, because I'm with you and I'm for you. So the problem is, for me has been that I don't realise that the words of the Bible are powerful for me in my situation. And if I don't, if I don't believe that, if I don't know that, then I won't be able to help anybody. I won't be able to share the gospel. I won't be excited about the gospel, because actually I'm, I'm quite disconnected from the gospel. Do you see what I mean? If I'm not, if I don't believe that I'm somehow in this story, part of this story, why would I invite anybody else to be part of it? How could I invite anybody else to be part of it? The problem for me was that I was raised, and it's different for different people. I was raised, uh, I became a Christian at the age of sort of 22, but I inherited a Christianity, which wasn't biblical Christianity. I inherited middle class Christianity. You see, I was told, I was told, I mean, the, the society, the family in which I grew up, we were pro Jesus. We would have voted Jesus in an election. But I was told that what was most important in life was to make something of yourself. You strive to make something of yourself. You work hard, you show yourself approved. You try and make yourself successful so you can look after your family. Now that's good advice, but it's not good news. It's not the biblical idea of good news. It also disagrees with the Bible. In the letter to the Philippians, Paul says of Jesus, not considering equality with God, <coughs> so that to be grasped that, he made himself what? Famous? Wealthy? No. Nothing. And the Lord... Made himself nothing, so that God's glory could be shown through him. So if I'm a Christian following a guy who made himself nothing, and I'm striving to make something of myself, well, no wonder I'm not seeing fruit. I inherited a Christianity where I was shown, not by what, pe people said the right things. We were orthodox, we said the right things. But I was shown by how people lived that life wasn't all about Jesus. Life was about providing comfort and security for yourself and your family. Again, that's great. That's good. That's good advice. But it's not good news. And in the letter to the Hebrews, the writer says right at the start of the letter to the Hebrews, it says of Jesus that God the Father made the whole universe through him and appointed him heir to all things. It says of Jesus that he is the full radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Jesus sustains all things, all things. By his powerful word. My friends, the Bible tells us that life is all about Jesus. And if the Bible is wrong about that and life is not all about Jesus, then the Bible is lying and we don't have to take any of it seriously. However, if the Bible is not lying and life is all about Jesus, then somebody else is lying. And for me, it was middle class Christianity. I inherited a Christianity where the good news was basically that I was white and raised in the West. Well, hooray. Because that's not the good news. That's not my inheritance. I inherited a middle class Christianity, but that's not my inheritance. It's not this guy's inheritance either. He's got some apples for me, this is great. <laughs> Here you go. So I've got a steady cook. 
<laughs> We're just talking about the Lord, mate. <laughs> That's it, you applaud, it's good news. <laughs> That's why we call it the gospel, isn't it? <laughs> so, I inherited it, but that's not my inheritance. That's not, we talked about inheritance earlier. It's not my inheritance. My inheritance is not a graduate job and a mortgage and a nice retirement for two years before I have a heart attack. That's not my inheritance. The stairway to heaven is not a career ladder and it's not a property ladder. The Bible says that my inheritance is something that can never perish, can never spoil, and can never fade. And it's things like this. Love, hope, purpose, joy, freedom, fullness of life. Things like that. That is your actual inheritance. Amen. That is your actual... These things are not vague concepts. These are real things that have a source. And the source is God. And you can experience these things as real things. Freedom is a real thing. And you know what? If you are already a Christian in this room, it's tr if you're not, then it's already true. It's still true for you, but there's a decision that you have to make about the cross and about who Jesus is. But if you are already a Christian in this room, please listen to this next bit. Freedom is your birthright. Amen. Amen. Freedom is your birthright. You have been given a large share in hope. You have ownership of Hope, capital H. Laughter was created with you in mind. That's how valuable you are. Honestly. I'm not just talking to you as a group. I'm talking to you individually. Hear it for you individually as well as corporately. You have a large share in hope. Freedom is your birthright. That's how valuable you are. You are worth dying for. No other God, no other world leader, no other celebrity ever has said that you are worth dying for and then went on to show you that it was true by doing it. That's why we call it the gospel, because it's good news. That's how valuable you are. And imagine, imagine, it, cause people sometimes say to me, uh, I had a guy come up to me after a gig, he wasn't, he wasn't following Jesus, he wasn't a Christian, he said, I was confused, I was surprised that you weren't trying to convince me that God exists. In your preaching, I said, yeah, because you know what? Believing that God exists won't change anything. It won't change your life. Do you know what? Even believing that Jesus rose from the dead, believing that that is a fact, it won't change your life. Because the book of James says, even the demons believe that. Do you know, the demons have the right theology. I haven't checked with them recently, but I don't think most of them are following the Lord. <laughs> the demons have the right theology, but they're not following Jesus. Believing that the resurrection is a fact will not change your life. What will change your life is living as though the resurrection is the truth. And it might seem abstract, but it is true. It won't change your life to believe the resurrection is a fact. What will change your life is living as though the resurrection of Jesus is the central truth at the heart of the cosmos. That will change your life. Because that will change your mind. Things change when your mind changes. That's what repentance means, you know. Like, lots of us have been brought up to believe that repentance just means stop being naughty. It doesn't. It means change your mind and turn around. Change your mind about what? About who God is and how much he loves you and who you are in his presence. And turn away from what? Turn away from the path that's not bringing you joy or life or identity or freedom. And turn towards the only guy who's offering it. That's what repentance is. And some Christians in this room need to repent. You need to change your mind about how loved you are, about how valuable you are, about how free you can be. It's not primarily about how we feel. We live in a society based on feelings. And feelings are great servants, but terrible masters. It's about knowing. Like this is through the New Testament. This is why mindfulness, have you heard of mindfulness? Mindfulness is such a powerful thing at the moment. And it's so good because people feel like they're growing. Mindfulness is simply about, and don't get me wrong, mindfulness is not the gospel, but like all pretty good things which are not true, they borrow from the stuff that is true. Mm -hmm. So mindfulness is about just being aware, controlling your thoughts, and directing your thinking. And that is all the way through the New Testament. Paul, Romans 12 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what, tra by changing your mind, that's what transforms you. John 8, Jesus says, you will know the truth, 
and that truth will set you free. Not, you will have a funny feeling. Like, I feel amazing this morning because I've had loads of tea. <laughs> and I'll feel weird later because I've had four hours of sleep. But my feelings are not a gauge of truth. Jesus says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And once you do know things, our feel feelings come about what we know. Like, if you believe that you are worthless, you will feel worthless. If you believe that you are free, you will find out that you are living as though you are free. You will feel free. It all starts up here. Which doesn't mean that it's not a spiritual thing. It doesn't mean that it's all just a mind game. We've, there's still the Lord. There's still the cross. This is why mindfulness is not the truth. Because mindfulness is just having good thoughts without the relationship with God. You need the relationship with God. You've got to come to the cross. Because the cross is the only place in the universe where your pain doesn't get to win. So you've got to come to the cross. So I want you to hear me on that. But it's all throughout the New Testament. Romans 6, Paul says, think of yourselves as dead to sin. You are dead to sin. So think about it that way. James 1, consider it pure joy when trials come. It doesn't say, when trials come, you'll feel amazing. It doesn't say that. When trials come, consider it pure joy. You've been given the mind of Christ. You have been given the mind of Christ. We should think about using it, shouldn't we? All of us, we should think about using it. I, you preach to yourself first of all. Please, I'm not preaching as though I've nailed this. Like I cry a lot when I preach because like I realise that it's true and I haven't been living it. I'm not crying yet because like it's quite a small room. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But <laughs> <laughs> once you once you realise once you realise that that this is true and it's for you, it will change your life. Like. Let's give you an example. So, uh, what's your name, my friend? Who? Nice to meet you. You can leave this morning. I don't mean now. <laughs> no, you get out. You are late. So you are last one in, first one out, mate. <laughs> you can now read. Maybe you've already been doing it. I'm using you as an example because you're at the front. You can read Galatians 5.1 where it says, It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. And you can put yourself in that. It's for freedom that Christ has set me free. We've got Sophie here. Sophie got me some chewing gum from the shops. <laughs> Sophie, you can read Romans 8, where it says, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And you can read it honestly, intelligently, intellectually, but authentically, and read it as, I am convinced that nothing can separate me, Sophie, from the love of God. Mm -hmm. Andy Robertson here. You can read Galatians 4, 6, and 7. Like, I am no longer a slave. I, Andy Robertson, am no longer a slave, but a son. Imagine if you actually read the Bible like that. If you actually believed it. Imagine if you actually left this morning knowing that those things were true. What you would find is that you would have felt more free. Because Jesus says you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But I just want to encourage you that like, this is why we read it. It's not just an inspirational old book. It's living and active. And it's for you. And it will change your mind. It will change your life. And once it's changed you, that's when you can change other people. That's when you can help the healing. That's, that's when you can start the healing process. That's when you can help the broken and the imprisoned and the trapped and the enslaved and the addicted. That's when you can help. Because you know who you are then. Once you know who you are, you can help other people to know who they are and who they were born to be. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Uh, I, was, um, I was out in, in Huddersfield before we moved and... Uh, I was going around the streets just praying for people, trying to pray for people, and I found a big group, I was with my friend Ola, who's a Nigerian guy, and uh, we found this big group of teenagers, and we offered to pray for them, and uh, some of them were interested, some of them were saying that we were same-sex attracted, or that we had learning difficulties, you know what teenagers are like, I was really grateful for all of that feedback, but <laughs> their, their leader, their leader, a guy called Nathan, he's only 15 years old, big guy, he's not aggressive, but he's confrontational, he comes up to me and he says, uh, what? What do you mean? You're praying? Who are you praying to? Are you religious? Which God are you praying to? Why do you want to pray for me? What, what's going on? And I heard God say, and this is annoying when Christians say I heard God say. I used to find this terribly annoying, even when I became a Christian. What does it mean to say I heard God say? All I mean when I say I heard God say is that a thought came into my mind that corresponded with a feeling in my heart that I should say something. That, that's all I mean. It's the same voice that says, you've got to pick up your daughter from nursery, you're already four hours late. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been the Lord as well, now that I think about it. But, 
But it's not this idea of like hearing from God. It's not like God's spirit and our spirit. Like He's given us our minds. He's given us our imaginations. We can we can relax about it. We can just speak stuff out, and if it's wrong, well, it doesn't matter because our identity is not affected. Anyway, I heard God say, "This guy's never met his dad. Ask him about it." That's just it. Just came into my. I didn't. I wasn't like concentrated. Very, just came into. I said, "Lord, what have you got?" And then that thought just came into my head. I said, Nathan, tell me about your dad. And he went from being the alpha male and he dropped. He looked at the floor. He said, I've never met my dad. I said, Nathan, I knew that because God's just told me that. He's like, what? I said, no, it sounds a bit weird, but like, I just want you to know. I just want you to know that, because I can see by the way that, I'm paraphrasing you, but this is the conversation we had. I can see by the way your head dropped that the loss of your father is, is real. <coughs> and you have a real desire to have a father, to have a dad. And I've got some good news for you, mate. The good news is that there is a dad out there, a perfect dad, who loves you. And it's God. It's God the Father. He loves you. And the Bible tells me a couple of things. It tells me that he knew you before he made you in your mother's room. He knew you. It also tells me that he offers to never leave you and never forsake you. Imagine that. A dad who would never leave you and never forsake you. And I want you to think about that, mate. Because I believe that God can show you what it's like to have a real dad. And Jesus can show you that. Because Jesus will model that for you. I wanted to think about that. And there was no great there was no great miracle, like I'm nearly finished, don't worry. There was no great miracle, like he didn't start crying. But what happened was, as I was speaking to him, I saw something change in his eyes. Something raised in his eyes that looked a lot like hope. Something raised in his eyes that looked a lot like hope. Because what I'd done, and all I had done, all I had done, I am not a great miracle worker. All I had done was to tell this guy who thought he was an orphan. That he wasn't born to be an orphan and God wasn't going to leave him that way. And that's why we call it the gospel because it's good news. And it's for all of us to share. We can all do it. We don't have to have theological degrees. We just have to have a heart to share God's love with people. And you know what? If you give God the availability, he'll give you the ability. And if you get it wrong, so what? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You just do what you can. You hold your part of the line. Quickly, very quickly. Liz, a friend of mine called Liz. When she was a little girl, she wanted to be a writer, she wanted to be an author. But instead of being a writer and an author, she was abused verbally, physically and sexually by her biological father. He used to school the word ugly on her wall. And when she was naughty, which according to him she was a lot of the time, he would make her stand outside overnight in any weather with no clothes on. That's what dad meant, that's what father meant to her. Very quickly she was taken off her parents and put into social services. But because no one had ever given her good news about who she was born to be, she had no identity. She went into prostitution and then she spent a lot of time on the streets being abused by scores and scores of men who also didn't realise that they were born to have an identity greater than the one they were living out. Then about seven years ago she met a group of people called Christians, you've heard of them, and they told her a different story. They told her a better story. They told her a story about a God who loved her so much he would come and meet her in her present, redeem her past and give her a future. And she believed them, she became a Christian and she's one of the most fascinating and interesting Christians I've ever met. And the last thing I want to do is just to read out. We had a week of prayer and I want to read out um, what Liz heard Jesus say to her when she was praying. Again, that might sound a bit weird, but like the idea is that God's our dad, we're his kids. That's a relationship. In a relationship, people talk to each other. It's all right. I'm not saying it's not weird. We are weird, but like you're weird. <laughs> everyone's, we everyone's weird. It's not about what's weird, it's about what's true. And what will set you free, and it will be this. Um, so Liz heard God say this to her. This is the girl who was abused. Father and dad meant abuse, it meant sexual abuse. And now it means unconditional love. That's the change of mind that has happened in her life. That's the repentance that has happened in her life. This is what Jesus says to Liz, and also to you, because it's for you. It's for you. It says this. My cross is not clean. It is stained with blood. My blood that I shed for my people. Do not be afraid to bring your troubles to the cross and to me. I will always welcome you, even if you are angry at me. I love you unconditionally, no matter what you think you have done. Do not be afraid to make mistakes. I will not punish you or persecute you when you make a mistake. Each mistake is the very first mistake. All I will do is love you and throw my arms around you. I can offer you freedom 
and all you have to do is take it. I can offer you freedom and all you have to do is take it. Final thing, the verse, Colossians 2.15. Colossians 2.15 says, having disarmed, says of Jesus, having disarmed powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, <coughs> triumphing over them by the cross. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. What do we mean by powers and authorities? We mean anything which is a servant of death. Without the love of God, death is the greatest power in the universe. The story of Jesus is the story of love itself coming down and taking on death in the greatest rap battle of all time. And for the first time ever, death loses. And all of its minions lose as well. The powers and authorities might be in your life, they might be depression, they might be anxiety, it might be self-harm, it might be porn addiction, it might just be the fear that we were talking about earlier. Do you know what? These things are on the cross. They are on the cross. That's what the cross is. The cross is the thing that killed Jesus, but it is a stop sign for everything that would seek to kill you. The cross is a cosmic <coughs> restraining order against the powers of death and destruction. And that's why we call it the gospel, because it's good news. But you've got to come to the cross. You've got to be on the right side of the cross, because it's the only place in the universe where death loses. It's the only place in the universe where your pain doesn't get to win. And what we're not saying, we're not saying if you're suffering from anxiety or you're suffering from addiction, we're not saying these things aren't real. And we're not saying that you should feel guilty or ashamed. What we are saying is, what I am saying is, what Jesus is saying is, because of the cross, because all the powers and authorities have been taken care of at the cross, whatever it is that you're suffering with and struggling with doesn't get to win. Amen. It doesn't get to beat you. It doesn't get to have the final say. At the cross, love wins, stops being just a cool hashtag to put on social media, and becomes a cosmic reality. Because of the cross, love actually wins. And we can know today that we are part of that amazing story. And knowing that, let's go out and share God's love with people. The thing that changed it for me uh, with Anne, remember Anne when I talked about that about three hours ago? And my wife said to me, get up off the floor, get off the carpet and go and wash her car. So I did, I went to wash her car and we became really good friends after that. And then when Anne, just before we left Manchester, Anne died, she had uh, stomach cancer and she died. Um, but p the people who'd rallied around her were all Christians in the community. She didn't have any family, but she was surrounded by Christians. Even the nurse who was with her when she died was, was a, a follower of Jesus. And it meant that in those latter days of her life, we were able to speak truth. We were able to speak God's love. We were able to reconcile and try and reconcile. And like, I don't know what decision Anne made. I don't know what decision she made at the end. I don't know what, what she did with the cross or what she did with Jesus. But I believe that God put us there for a reason, to share his love and his truth. And I have this real hope, because she hadn't been a Christian lady all of her life. But we know about the thief on the cross. Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise. And I've got this real hope that when it's my turn to go home, I'll get to the gates of heaven and I'll knock on the door and Anne will just open it like this. There you are! <laughs> Amen. said to you through Andy. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.